you have had very interesting presentations under various angles, the last is one academic. Um, I am born into trade, and so my angle will be trade. And in the uh, short address to you, um, the first part will be what have we experienced in these 10 years? What was our environment? And then uh, adding to that some important elements from the book to see w where we stand and where we head for. So 10 years of Belt and Road, and if you look back in the last decade and the first years of that, we all experienced very severely the financial crisis, but 2023, uh, 13, uh, 2013, uh, it was under control. It was not really digested, but the financial crisis was under control. Uh, there were uh, also political tensions, as always, but also there they seemed to be in a controlled manner. The China trade double-digit growth there was diminishing, disappearing, but still uh, China was in very healthy, steady and unchallenged growth figures. And at the time, the Belt and Road advocated to do lots of efforts on global trade. Global trade, they saw it as, and they see it as a tool to share the prosperity amongst the people. A global trade in a respect and cooperation between nations and global trade as a tool to achieve peace as wealth is then shared amongst the people. Basic principles of the uh, Belt and Road. And then we see as a result that uh, lots of projects were launched also in logistics, infrastructure works, impressive infrastructure works, and, and also hurdles in regulations and administrations were gradually erased. A land bridge was installed with trains from China into Europe, but also a sea bridge link was put into place. And if you look at the achievements, uh, we could say an, an, uh, a continuous effort from China to improve the openness and making its market accessible and transparent. Some might argue about that uh, with criticism, but the response is, look at China. It's a continent. Uh, and and it it aims at openness but it takes time not not everything can be achieved at once but there is definitely the willingness to to reach that global market player and to help it with regulations and administrations so i would say a lot of improvements have uh, happening there and what i remark and, and it's also repeated in the recent publication, there is an immense effort going on in research and development with implications in the industry to improve the quality of what is produced and offered. Not growth, as you referred, not just growth, we will come back to it, but a new growth, a, a, a growth with a, a green approach and all that. And if you look at the, for example, what we witness in our portrait, the electric cars, the cars export from China, the batteries, the digitalization amongst others. N not later than yesterday, I had the honor to receive a delegation from BYD. BYD is, I would dare say, the most important car producer in China. BYD stands for Build Your Dream. Some say, bring your dollars, but <laughs> <laughs> something else. BYD. So BYD uh, came, they are, 95% of pr their production is domestic. But now they will, they will start with their exports. And they're looking for a home place, of course, Zeebrugge will be the place. That's something else. But I, s I, I spoke with them and I said, 
What is your production nowadays? And remember, the company only exists for 20 years. Their production is 3 million cars a year. 3 million cars. Then I said, with what I know from other makes, and bear in mind they are in the top 10 in the world, BYD. So I said, mm, in that massive production, do you, do you face problems in g getting the parts in to, to follow up with that? You know what the reply was? No, because BYD produces everything themselves. The chips, the software, the suspension, the batteries, everything is produced by BYD, a company ranking in the first 10 in the world, only 20 years in existing, nowadays producing 3 million cars. That's an example of where I say a lot of efforts on research and development with applications in the industry. So, China is strengthening its position over these years politically and economically, and with it we witness a growing rivalry with US. And I take it for my responsibility, but I'm convinced everything that is published and challenged from one side to another relates to the rivalry with US as China is growing as a political and commercial economical partner. The COVID restrictions were lifted beginning of the year. Everybody was expecting a boom in trade. It has not materialized. We have not seen, we have seen a hesitating, uh, but we have not seen a boom in trade and production in China. And then you can wonder what is the cause. Um, I'm not an expert in that because that's not my field, but repetitively it's addressed that the property market collapsed in intra-China. We have the conflicts, the war with Ukraine and the countermeasures for Russia, which have closed down markets for now. We have had the isolated years of COVID, yeah. We have in the rivalry, the trade restrictions that have been imposed on China and the countermeasures that is not helping the trade. We see here the galloping inflation and increased interest rates, and recently, of course, the drama in the Middle East, amongst others. And on top, we see that the global warning, warming is no longer a theory, but it's a threat that needs thoroughly addressed and even faster than what was expected. And all this has led to an increased protectionism and rivalry, reducing the consumption, I would call it a distorted global trade. But there are positive signs also. European leaders discuss with China to elaborate, el elaborate on opportunities rather than to deepen the differences. And no later than this month, President Xi Jinping and President Biden met to elaborate on the way forward. And I have no doubt it is understood that we face enough difficulties and horror in our planet that we should not escalate. That must have been the agenda of what is discussed. And it has been said before, we have on a global scale issues to address, maybe a thought of why should we rival for who is number one if there is place for two. Yeah. If we now read with this background that we all experience, if we read the latest publication of uh, Xi Jinping, the governments of China, allow me to highlight but I feel some important elements. Not to a surprise, the, there is a confirmation of the set goals of Belt and Road, and it's aimed to relaunch where necessary the distorted global trade. Goals like wealth, stability, trade, trade as a tool for harmony and for peace. 
It includes boosting the China-Arab cooperation, working on the Asia-Pacific area for prosperity, a multilateral trade system with the World Trade Organization in the lead. Therefore, the publication foresees a strengthening of the connectivity to facilitate a smooth and safe and an orderly flow of people, goods, capital and data. Data related to digitalization, capital after the turmoil of the financial crisis with all these lunatic products that were produced, goods, the trade, the global trade and people, free flow of people. It foresees further the strengthening of the cooperation among the political parties and seek developments sharing the benefits amongst the people in a fair manner. They advocate a new development de philosophy based on high quality development and growth. China will clarify its strategy directions and maintain a long term growth thereby stabilizing employment, finance, foreign trade, inbound investment and market expectations. It's a competitive and sustainable, self-reliant, very important to the Chinese policy, self-reliant in science and technology, expanding and strengthening the digital economy. Direct directly related to the health China, China wants to protect the earth with a sustainable development seeking to harmonize the relationship between humanity and nature the aim grows falls a sustained pattern with a green approach not growth for growth but a sustained green pattern growth lastly only highlighting some elements in the publication, I would dare talk about the politics within China. First of all, with all what has to be addressed and looking at the big continent, China advocates the overall uni uni unity with the one party leadership. A centralized, unified leadership in order to safeguard correct directions of China and to overcome unifiedly the difficulties. And it repeats its position on Taiwan. I dare, I have no political responsibility, but I dare repeat it because sometimes aggression is advocated here in the Western world, where it is unfair, uh, concerning Taiwan. Taiwan is an internal method for China and its unification is aimed at in a peaceful way because China is not an aggressor. Look at the history, China is not an aggressor. And look at a good example of Macao with one country, two system, the same they want to apply and is applied in Hong Kong. To conclude, I bring a humble personal expectation of where are we going for. As said, nowadays the global trade is disrupted. In Europe, the, conf the confidence of the consumer is very low, except my wife, nobody consumes. You know. <laughs> if the external factors are not changing, and by external factors I think about conflicts and all the restrictive trade measures. If they are not going to change, we could envisage, to put it lightly, a transition period, which will be a slow and lengthy recovery. Some would call it the new normal after COVID. I refuse to accept this as a position. because. I believe in a change of these external factors and a change I can only think to the better. If this happens, markets will rebound quickly as the consumers are being deprived 
for long time deferred needs. I rather believe this to happen. And if it happens, if these signals are there, everybody politically responsible in, on our planet has to abolish as fast as possible all trade restrictions that exist both ways don't no talk about lengthy and loss of face abolish this to support to restore the global trade as the global trade is the only guarantee to return to stability and to achieve uni united the global ch challenges that we face thank you